All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is exciting. This is a topic that is both old and new. Uh, data quality is nothing new. We've been dealing with it for years and years and years. Even before databases existed, people had filing cabinets full of paper, and there were surety mistakes inside of them. And so data quality is an eternal issue we've been dealing with forever. It doesn't stop being an issue, but the more downstream things we do, the more complex our usage of that data gets, uh, the more ways we have to muck it up and make our lives very difficult. So our goal here is to talk about data quality through the lens of AI. That is, we're going to throw complicated algorithms at our data. What does that mean for data quality? I'm going to move kind of quickly. My goal is to save some time at the end for questions, because questions are great. Um, but if there aren't any, we can also just chat and have fun as well. So I'm just going to dive right on in very quickly. I've already gotten the intro. Um, this is just more stuff. I will skip it because we already got a cool intro. The agenda is straightforward. Uh, really, we're going to talk about data quality, uh, the classic problem, how to solve it, why it matters, and then what are all the things we do in AI that make our lives more difficult because of this? We'll bring it all together at the end and save a little bit of time for questions. So this is an example of a software development lifecycle. There are many out there. Different organizations, different sizes have different variations of this. If you're a small organization, you have a little less. If you're big, you may have more. But the basic idea is there's design, there's architecture, you build some software, you test a whole bunch, iterate, and eventually deploy, maintain, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of arrows, a lot of boxes, and these are all here primarily so that we make good decisions. We add quality new features, make good decisions, make few mistakes, and then release something that users love, right? That's the whole point of software development. <clears throat> but where that is kind of where a mature product would behave in terms of how we go from an idea to code in a production environment, what very often happens in AI is a little bit like this. Not exactly, I'm exaggerating, but it's funny, right? <clears throat> Somebody comes and says, we want the bright, shiny new thing now. And you say, okay, when do you want it by? And they say next week and you work really fast and a new feature goes out and it's cool because the new shiny thing's worth a lot, right? And so very often we skip steps. We hurry, we skip, we do everything we can to get things out and that's dangerous, right? We're skipping a software design life cycle. So part of this entire conversation is that we should treat anything we develop in AI to be very much like any other software development, right? It's just features. Uh, in the same way that database development is just development, software development is development, AI development, machine learning algorithms, analytics, dashboarding, all those things that we do with our data later, it's just development. So treat it like development. Uh, if you do what I show on the screen right now, things may not work the way we want them to. You'll get some surprises that, you know, surprise cake for your birthday, good, surprise bugs, not so good, right? There's more challenges though. What are the challenges we face with data and AI? And these are common challenges, some of them. For example, data grows, right? Data gets bigger. It always gets bigger. We have more databases, more data, we have more data sources, and it can be from anywhere, right? Data begins somewhere. It begins in a transactional database, in edge devices, in some data source element place somewhere where it's being created. And then it exists, it's used, right? It's used by applications, <clears throat> used in UIs, used by users, used by people. But then more things happen to that data. We begin getting bigger and asking more questions about our data. And so we begin copying it. We make replicas of it. Maybe we'll do some transformations of that data to make it easier to report on. We want to provide dashboards and reports to users or to internal to an organization or to executives or to who knows who else, shareholders. There's a million places that data can be used. And so after transforming it and playing with it a bit, we may eventually put it into other places, uh, into Redshift or Snowflake, a data lake, a warehouse, a lake house, whatever. Data goes somewhere else and we work with it downstream. Uh, and so because data is growing and evolving over time and moving a lot, <clears throat> we have a way of making mistakes along the way and those mistakes get copied. Well, as soon as a mistake is made with data, and you have a data quality issue, it just passes through this process, whatever it looks like, and continues its way to the end, which isn't very good. And you know, downside to AI processes, which is an additional problem, is they like returning answers. They don't give results, they give answers. We want our AI to tell people what they want to know. Like, I want to know what a plane ticket costs. Give me the price. I want to know what car you'd recommend for my lifestyle, go and give me the right answer. So they're very authoritative in nature. So if you have bad data, 
then you're going to authoritatively give bad answers, which is a challenge. So we want to build authoritatively good answers. And data quality is the linchpin to all of this. So many of this is going to be a classic answer. How do we prevent bad data? This is going to begin in the land of classic data problems and end in the land of AI. So we're going to start with things you may have heard before, or maybe things you do already, maybe things you don't do already. The simplest way to prevent bad data is to prevent it at the source. So you're at the beginning of the data lifecycle. You're in an application. You're pulling in data from edge devices. People are processing orders or buying things or bank transactions or whatever. You could be anywhere. Data is being created for the first time. It's being stored somewhere. And we want to make sure it's correct. This is where data begins. So how do we do that? And there's different ways to do it. You can be strict about it and have things like check constraints, data constraints, foreign keys, uh, database constructs that ensure that if you try to put bad data in there, it will fail. And those are good things to have if they're available to you because they ensure you can't have bad data. If your database says you can't do this, then you can't do this. Problem solved, right? We can't do that in every system, but when we can, it's nice. Uh, some systems put data in out of order and do other things where you just can't do it. Or you're in a platform where those sorts of constraints don't make sense. Uh, you can still validate data, though. <clears throat> the application can validate data. The database could have a process to validate data. Or you can simply run reports after the fact or validation processes after the fact that check data and say, is it good? And is it bad? And then deal with it in whatever the appropriate way is. It's important to note that any bad data created here lasts forever. Anything else you do with it from this point on will have mistakes in it, and it's going to stay there. So if we could fix it at the source, that's a very good thing. And note that I mentioned validating data at multiple levels. There's value in that. Sometimes we like to think to ourselves, oh, if the app is checking our data for us, we're good, right? We don't have to worry about anything else. The database can be kept simple, straightforward, small, and compact. But we're assuming the app is perfect. And if you've built an app where there's no bugs, and that's the way it's been for its life cycle, that's awesome. Uh, but most apps don't behave that way. Things go wrong. We have bugs. We fix bugs. Bad data is created. So consider when you're validating data in, in the, its creation state, having it checked in multiple places. It's a great way. And the same way you layer security, layer data validation and, and, and data integrity checking, because this is the beginning of data. It's bad here. It's bad forever. From here, where does data go? Well, you start with transactional data. We start with application data. And it begins moving along. It may get copied. <clears throat> it may end up in an analytic environment, because we want to run reports, whether they're inward facing, outward facing. Uh, if there's any sort of analytics going on at all, decisions are being made based on it. And so we want the decisions to be made correctly. So how do we do that? Validating data is not hard, honestly. You don't have to check every single value. You don't have to make sure everything is correct. Uh, very often, simply checking the, the general data size and data shape after data gets moved or copied somewhere or transformed is good enough. If the amount of data that I have changed by more than x percent day over day, or, or like over like, we want to know. If the data returned to zero for a day, if the number of data sources goes up or down by a lot, if the byte count goes up or down by a lot, things like that. Very, very easy to check and very easy to tell when something's wrong. If we get a 1,000 rows from somewhere every single day and suddenly it's a million, that's unusual. And there's a reason, right? Similarly, we can look at values as well, uh, uniqueness of values. There's certain values that should always be unique. Uh, are nulls and blanks allowed or not? Are there values that are invalid? You know, very often we'll say, take an integer, store a value, but we know it can't be negative. But we're storing it as an int anyway. You can check and see, are there negatives? And you may say, like, that can't possibly happen, but we know how these things work. If you allow a negative, somebody will put a negative in if you allow it to happen. It's just what QA does, right? That's how we do things. Negative a million. It's just as valid as positive a million if you allow it, right? Uh, missing data is important, as is duplicate data. These are key validations that are not hard to check for. If you have some key value that should be unique, make sure it only appears once per value. Because again, in the analytic world, we very often will have less constraints. We'll have less validation that's built into data structures. But we can check it, right? You can load data, check it. You can copy data, check it. You can transform it, check it. It's very fast. It's very easy. And once you've checked any data you've loaded, you can put that then onto your giant pile, mountain of, of existing data, and not worry about it again. Also consider edge cases. Uh, edge cases happen a lot in data. Are they valid or not valid edge cases? Do they mean something and we should have them? Or are they crazy? 
if I see in my order processing system that somebody placed an order for $10 trillion, I would assume that edge case is probably invalid. Nobody is making an order that large, right? On the other hand, if I saw an order for a million dollars, I would say, all right, that number is really big. Probably somebody should look at it, um, but it could be valid, right? Somebody could spend a million dollars in something as improbable as it may be. That's at least feasible. Uh, negative million dollars, not possible. Negative numbers, you can't spend a negative number of dollars, right? So we can check for things like that and understand is it correct or not. And importantly here, this validation should all occur before the data is moved again, before it's used for anything else. This is your second chance. So you check it at its source, and you check it after it's been moved and copied. And each time it gets moved and copied, there needs to be validation. And it amazes me how many systems I've worked with over my lifetime and seen and heard about where there's no validation. Data simply moves all over the place, and people just use it. And that's it. Uh, just keep in mind that if you do that, you're riding on hopes and dreams. But hopes and dreams aren't very scientific, uh, nor do they really help you get good data. Uh, I've hoped and dreamed a lot, and my data quality has never gone up as a result. So I highly recommend validation as opposed to hopes. Uh, they don't really help as much. And of course, one big piece that doesn't always get uh, considered is what happens when things change. Uh, software releases happen all the time in applications, in the analytic world, in the AI world. Things change, right? You decide to go from you know, chat GPT to a new version of chat GPT. We're going to upgrade and try a new version. We're going to move everything to that. But that changes things, right? Or maybe a software release goes up to a transactional application. Well, check and make sure that any data impacted by the release is checked, validated, looks good. Also ensure that new data being created is also checked, validated, good. Uh, and this is really what QA is for, right? Quality assurance is there to ensure that changes happen well. That's important. Uh, but if we don't do that, though, there's always a chance that things will go wrong going forward. And now you're in a world where some of your data is good and some of your data is bad. We have to come back and deal with that later, which I suppose is better than all bad data. But just keep in mind that uh, changes to any tier of your application, whether it's a transactional app, whether it's a production database, whether it's uh, ETL, ELT, data movement, data copying, analytics, AI, machine learning, whatever, those are all changes. It's your QA tested, data validated, it's important. Something else too that's kind of a, a fundamental in database design that gets often thrown away when we start talking about things so far downstream are what do our names of things look like? What do our data types look like? These are classic problems we've dealt with that are, are very often seen as the beginning of the lifeline um, for our data, but they matter more now than ever because we're going to take data and throw it into an AI algorithm and say, hey, look at my data, process it, uh, understand it, and then answer my questions about it. If you, have mis if you have metadata problems, not just data problems, but you have metadata problems, then there is a chance the AI will make a mistake based on, this is really common. We've all probably run into metadata problems like this. And if you haven't, you will, but you're lucky so far, I suppose. For example, I have a couple fun examples here just for, you know, heck, just to throw some ideas out here. You know, what if you saw a data element uh, that was an integer named invoice? What would, that, what would that be? If you're an AI algorithm consuming this, what do you think it would be? Does it mean there is an invoice, yes or no? Is it the invoice amount? Is it an invoice number? I don't really know what it is. I can guess. I can look at the data and guess. Uh, but there's no guarantee I'll be right. I'll be right sometimes, and I might be wrong sometimes. So look at any data you have, and look at the names, the data types, the sizes, and validate, is this correct or not? For example, if I had a, a date time named entry time, is it entry time, or is it really a date time? Because sometimes we store dates or times as date time, uh, or even as a string. Uh, strings are dangerous because they could have bad values, right? February 31st is not possible in uh, a date time that's typed correctly. Uh, but if it was a string, February 31st can happen. And, or you just mix up European and American times, for example. You know, some of us will write 229 for February 29th. But it, what about 29 slash 2 for 29th of February? Or year, month, day, year, day, month, so on and so forth. Those things matter here. AI is going to consume this, look at it, make decisions based on it. It needs to be clear. Similarly, if I had a call, and this is kind of a fun one, uh, very often we soft delete data because we want to keep it around for posterity, for reference purposes, for compliance purposes. And so we'll soft delete data, and we'll have some column or element named like is deleted or something, and then or is archived, whatever. And we'll have that out there, and then 
uh, at some point, AI comes and consumes this, and the algorithm will then maybe say, well, hey, uh, it's deleted. Okay, does that mean I should use this data as I crunch and return responses, or should I skip the ones that are deleted because they're deleted? Realistically, it doesn't really know what the right answer is. Uh, you and I may, um, but it won't. So consider that as well, that if there's any kind of ambiguous metadata or metadata that may influence decisions, you may have to train it or give it additional information to understand what it means, or just remove it altogether. If a column is something that you can simply resolve and say, you know what, I just don't want deleted data in there at all, then remove all the rows is deleted one, call it a day, never train with it, don't bring it in as rag data, just leave it out. Don't even give it to the algorithm, don't let it think about it, it's just noise at that point. And providing noise to an AI algorithm is only gonna create bad responses or just you know things people don't expect. Uh, the last thing you want to do is get information on a, an order you placed last year that you deleted and never actually placed, right? I filled my card up. I went to place the order. I said, oh, I don't want that stuff. I'm going to have to start over. And then it's giving me answers back about it later. That's not so good. One note is we have different kinds of data. Uh, I'll, these are two examples. You may have other data that goes into your algorithms, goes into your machine learning. Uh, keep in mind that each of these are different data sets. So you have training data. Uh, the purpose of training data is to ultimately tell your AI how to behave. What is its purpose? What is it going to do? How is it going to respond? What is it trying to? And if it's bad, what happens? Well, if you have bad training data, your model will simply return, not behave the way it should. It may return the right answers potentially, but it may not do it in the right way. Or it may give irrelevant answers that are still correct. You ask me what the color of the sky is, and I say 42, that's not a very helpful response. Maybe I was thinking of a wavelength instead or something else, but that isn't relevant or correct. So I can give the right answer to the wrong question. That's often what happens here. Uh, on the other hand, you have retrieval augmented generation. Um, that is rag data. That's the data you bring. So you train a model, it's behaving the way you want. Now you swap in your data, the actual data you care about, You've trained it to be a, you know, a bot that will answer questions about an airline, for example. Now you're going to bring your airline data in so it can use current information to do what it has to do. If your RAG data is incorrect, what do you get? You have invalid responses, bad answers. So it's important to know you have different sets of data, and bad data in any of these areas will result in different results at the end of the line. So you can have bad training data, which will provide one set of problems and headaches, and bad your data, RAG data, which will result in other headaches, different headaches. And if you have bad data in both, you may have a hard time diagnosing where the problem is. All right, so now we're going to talk about AI specific. How do we cheat? How do we do things we're not supposed to do to try to fix the problem? Because we have an app, we're close to releasing some new stuff, it's not behaving correctly, we've got to fix it. What are the things we do and then don't look back on that probably we shouldn't do? All right, <clears throat> this sounds fun, right? This is the most common one I see. It's very often that we're close. We have a, a interface that works nicely. It's almost correct all the time. Sometimes you get bad responses. Sometimes you get answers that aren't correct. So what do we do? We take our prompt and try to engineer it further. And we say, hey, you know what? We're really close. We'll just adjust it a little bit so that it doesn't give the wrong responses anymore. And this goes down a rabbit hole of kind of cause and effect, cause and effect. The purpose of prompt engineering is to provide purpose to an algorithm so that it knows what is it, what is its role, what is it supposed to be doing, how does it answer, things like that. That's what we're trying to do. It keeps things relevant. It makes sure that it's doing what you want it to do. If you have bad data coming in from anywhere in your process, and it consumes that bad data, you really can't prompt your way out of it. You can try. You can include details in your prompt to try to get around it. But the problem is you're changing its purpose now. And so you're trying to prompt your way out of bad data. But as you do so, you're going to make it behave differently in an effort to avoid bad data. And if you think of it more from a human perspective, like if you were going to ask somebody to answer questions for you on the phone, and you went to them and said, listen, this is really important. When you're answering questions about the airline, don't respond with that flight going to Bangkok tomorrow. Just don't mention it at all. And if they, if they ask about it, don't say anything. It's not $1,000. Like you begin giving these weird pointers, and a human being would say, what? What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. 
Um, but the algorithm is happy to consume whatever you give it. And so you prompt engineer, you put details in, and you might start getting correct answers to the problem you found, but I guarantee you will introduce complexities and wrong answers elsewhere. So you can't prompt your way out of bad data, and if you try, you will prompt yourself into other bad responses. Not a good way to go. Similarly, we have the world of the data we bring. Retrieval augmented generation, RAG data is data we bring. So you train your model on one data set, and then when you're happy with what you have, you bring your data and continue working with it. Um, you can't fix bad training with this, though. The purpose of RAG data is to be your data. For the flight, you know, for the airline example, I will have flight numbers and prices and layovers and durations and first class economy, whatever. I'll have all that data coming in for upcoming flights. People will ask questions, they'll get answers. <clears throat> the nice thing about this, though, is if you do have bad data in the RAG world, that's going to mean bad responses, just inaccurate answers. That's all. It's also easy to fix, though. This is the data set you're bringing. You simply identify where's the bad data, you fix it, and then after you fix it, you can go back and find the source of the bad data and fix the source as well, and then we're good, and you move on with life. Don't make it more complicated than it has to be. Uh, don't try to work around it. Don't try to train around it. Don't try to fine tune around it. Don't try to unlearn stuff. Uh, anything else you do to try to fix your bad bag data is just going to make things more complicated. And there really is a beauty and simplicity in this world. Uh, the more complicated your code gets for your AI algorithms, the harder it is to troubleshoot and to get back what you really want. Semantic search is fun because there's a lot of math involved here. I like personally, I love math. Math is fun to me. Uh, everyone believes that, but I enjoy it. Purpose of semantic search is to take and create associations in data. This helps us create more qualitative analysis. And so you have qual quantitative mathematical analysis that results in our ability to make things associate to each other so we can answer questions. So if I ask a question of an algorithm and it doesn't recognize all the words or sentences, it can figure out what I'm talking about based on meaning and, and sort it out, synonyms, things like that. And so under the covers, it's going to vectorize data, it's going to break it into chunks, it's going to create associations, assign numbers of similarity or dissimilarity, and then go from there. And this is really cool, but if you have bad data in here, you'll get bad associations. The good news is, this is kind of like a very basic example I like to use to show what vectorization looks like. So you're basically taking this many-dimensional model of relationships, and obviously this is smaller than any data you have, right? You have more than eight things and seven things you associate them with. You'll probably have hundreds, thousands, millions, whatever. But to simplify it, you look at this here and you see positive and negative numbers that indicate similarity or dissimilarity. If I were to be talking to an algorithm, a chatbot, whatever, and getting back wrong answers because of this, I can trace it back. So tracing back bad data from semantic search is actually not that bad because if I see that cat is associated to canine, and there's a high relevance factor for it, I'm going to say, all right, there's something wrong in my data. There's no way that would happen otherwise. Let me go dig into it and figure out where that came from and solve it. So the good news here is that if you see bad data here, you can reverse engineer it, solve it, and be done. Uh, but you can't work around it, though. If there's bad data here, it will continue to associate badly in the future. And canine doesn't just mean dog, it can mean wolf, it can mean something else. And so there's the potential for more bad associations that I simply haven't hit on yet because I found one does not mean that more aren't there somewhere. A few more fun ones here um, before I leave some time here for questions because questions are fun. Fine-tuning is something that we often misuse. Fine-tuning lets you take an algorithm and make it specific to a certain use case. Like for example, let's say that I have my airline model and I like it, but I want to make a couple of specific use cases out of that, one for cargo and one for first class, because those just tend to be very different from everything else. I want them to kind of be tailored specifically to the crowds that will be interested in paying money for those services. To really do this correctly, though, you have to have spend a little bit of time understanding the use cases, the business model, and what you're trying to do. An important key is that you can't find, like you can't rag your way out of bad data, you can't uh, unlearn it, untrain it, you can't prompt engineer your way, you can't fine tune your way out of bad data. If you have a data problem, fine tuning is not going to fix it. The purpose of fine tuning is to make a model more specific. That's all. It's supposed to allow it to handle a subset of use cases that are important to you under certain circumstances. And fine tuning for that purpose is easy, uh, but it takes time and effort.
do it correctly. It's not going to solve bad data. And if you try to solve bad data here, again, you're saying, hey, model, I'm giving you a purpose. But by the way, as part of that purpose, avoid this and don't do this. And, and this should really be this. That's not a purpose. That isn't providing a use case that's confusing. Uh, whenever you're not really sure if something you're doing is correct, think about talking to a human being to ask them to do these things. Would it make sense or not? And if it's total nonsense, then it's probably nonsense to the algorithm as well. So fine tuning is to create specific use cases. It's not meant to solve bad data. Here's a new one that's been coming up more and more. And this has been proven through recent studies that are really interesting. Um, many models have a way, and many apps have ways to unlearn data. Basically say, all right, you know what? I have an algorithm that's doing great, but I want to forget certain things. It, it, there's bad data, there's PII, there's copyrighted material, there's, there's something I just don't want it to ever talk about. So remove it. And the reality of this right now is that all the unlearning methods that are out there right now are pretty rudimentary. Um, they might kind of work, but there's more of a chance they're going to harm your model than help it. It's very much like me saying one day, like, you know what? Last week was horrible. I had a terrible week. Everything went wrong. I want to go in my brain and pull out all the neurons from last week and make all the memories go away. Um, can you try to do that? I'm sure there's some way to try to do that in science right now. I'm sure it'll have negative repercussions that I really, really wouldn't like. So it's, this is just a technology that's getting there. It's not there yet. If you try to do unlearning, be very cautious. Check, save, back up everything you're doing before you make anything permanent change to it, and be cautious. Unlearning, especially unlearn more data, will very often result in bad things happening. Uh, if you need to get rid of data, remove it from the data source. You know, if your RAG data has stuff in it you don't want to bring anymore, um, remove the data, present a new set of data, and, and go from there. That's far better than trying to tell it after the fact to exclude data, unlearn data, make it go away. Uh, for training data, this is even more important. Uh, you've built this model. You've built the way it behaves. You've worked with it. You like it. You've, you've adjusted it. Now to go in and begin ripping stuff out after the fact, it, it may have unintended consequences. So I, I highly recommend caution around unlearning data because you don't really know what the results are going to be like. And in current methods, current models, uh, a lot of harm can be done. And so I really just caution, caution here um, before doing it. These will get better with time. I'm sure they will. But there's always a danger in telling a model to forget stuff because it may forget more than you want it to, uh, or it may forget less, or it may forget who knows what. You may try to get rid of all the PII and accidentally get rid of additional information you need. Uh, or you may not get rid of all of it, and then you'll still give it to people inadvertently, but confidently after the fact. So I want to wrap up and have a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, this, this presentation really had a lot of information in it that was pre-existing, that existed long before AI was talked about to the public. It's been around for years, and a lot of newer things as well. And it's all the same. It all relates. We've been using data for analysis for a long time. It's not going to change. Uh, all the new algorithms out there are really just an extension of things we've already had. And this will keep happening and keep going on and keep going on. And so just keep in mind the best place to solve bad data is to do it at the source. Solve it early, cut it off before it can go downstream. Uh, AI, you know, messing with your AI models can do great things for them, but it won't be a substitute for good data. It can't solve good, bad data. It can't make your data better. You can try but you're far better, better off solving it earlier in your processes. <clears throat> once you're into a model, once you're testing it, once you're working with it, once you're QAing it, once you're letting people use it for real, keep testing carefully and check for responses. Whenever bad responses happen, find the source of it. Was it bad training? Was it bad rag data? Was it some changes you made that backfired? Figure out what the source is and resolve the source. This is the best way of solving problems in your models that really, really will make things better. So, I want to stop here. I'm going to provide a little bit of information about me. This will be in the slides later that get shared. I'll, I'll share them afterwards so you have them. Are there any questions?